Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the first event of our Doctor Class film series, Are We There Yet? Where we will be discussing the film Brincando el Charco by Francis Negron Montaner. Welcome Francis, it is an honor to have you with us tonight. My name is Marcela Ramos, I'm the program manager for the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, Dr. Class, film, art, film, and culture program. Are We There Yet? A film series on queer futures is curated by Laura Perez Munoz and Adri Rodriguez Rios, both doctoral students from the Department of Literatures and Romance Languages at Harvard. It is one of Dr. Glass' goal to have our students being actively uh, and participate actively in the center's programming and that this programming supports their academic research. So we're very excited about this collaboration. And thank you, Laura and Adri, for your interest, your input and hard work in putting this series together. The conversation will be moderated by one of them this evening, by Laura. So I'll let Laura introduce our speaker and tell us more about her research and the connection uh, between the film, the series, and the research. But before I hand the mic over, uh, please let me, let me introduce her and cover a couple of housekeeping items about today's session. Born and raised in Puerto Rico, Laura Perez Muñoz completed their BA in psychology from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus, and pursued her MFA in writing at Pratt University in Brooklyn, New York. Currently, Laura is fifth, a fifth year doctoral student in Romance Languages and Literature, Spanish and Latin extract. The research focuses on the queer dictions of Puerto Rican literature and poetry, the colonial studies, Caribbean and Latin American diaspora studies, immigration, border theory, feminism, performance, and visual narratives. So the practical info about today's session first will be, or we are recording today's webinar, and it will be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel shortly after today's session. We'll also email a link to recording to the recording to everyone who has registered. In the chat, we've added links to our online calendar as well as social media channels. Uh, you'll find it there and you can find more information about the events. The upcoming events, including uh, the next one from this series, A Fantastic Woman by Sebastian Lelio, scheduled for December 1st at 5 p.m. Finally, um, the chat function will be disabled, but you have the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, so please send questions uh, during, we're gonna answer at the end of the session, but feel free to submit at any time. So Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcela, for that very generous introduction. Uh, so first I wanna talk about the title of the film series, Are We There Yet? A film series on queer futures. Uh, so this came to be while Adri and I were working and defending our perspectives. Um, and we constantly brainstormed together. So uh, there were many points in which we convened in that a lot of the literature that we use for our research is uh, visual narratives and films. Um, and in order to like really delve into them, we wanted to really create a series where we could talk with a director, we could um, talk with other, the audience participants on what they thought about the film, more of the context, how it came to be. Um, so Are We There Yet is a curatorial exercise to interrogate um, philosopher Sose Muñoz's opening to Cruising Utopia, uh, Queerness is Not Here Yet. Uh, Jose Muñoz is uh, foundational in our research and that specific sentence haunts us uh, throughout um, our writing. Um, so 
Are We There Yet serves as a catalyst for an intersectional dialogue with the people who orchestrate the LGBTQIA plus narratives of the films we have selected. Um, and the series goal is to ignite conversations that hinge on our diverse border experiences while always looking out for the queer. Um, and with that said, I wanna thank uh, Marcela Ramos and the David Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center of Latin American Studies, Dr. Klaas, so much for providing us this space of conversation um, and dialogue and to further expand uh, and challenge our writing um, in this uh, very advanced and uh, anxiety inducing stage. Uh, so thank you so much and thank you everyone for being here um very happy and proud that that we're able to do this um so now i'm gonna present uh, frances negro montaner frances thank you so much for being here it's as marcela said it's an honor to have you um yeah uh, so frances is a puerto rican filmmaker writer and scholar uh, since very early in her academic and artistic career, she explores coloniality, primarily from Puerto Rico and the United States, uh, with attention to uh, the intersections of race, uh, class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and politics. Uh, she obtained a bachelor's in sociology at the University of Puerto Rico, a master's in visual anthropology, and an MFA in film and video at Temple University, Philadelphia and completed a PhD in comparative literature from Rutgers University. Uh, and she currently is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. Um, it's important to mention uh, that before Brincando el Charco um, in 1989, along with Peter Biela, she co-directed AIDS in the Barrio, Eso no me pasa a mi, that doesn't happen to me an educational documentary about the situation of the Puerto Rican community in Philadelphia and the responses to the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, then in 1994, she releases the award-winning film Brincando el Charco, Portrait of a Puerto Rican. And for English speakers, Brincando el Charco uh, directly translates to uh, jumping the puddle. Uh, the puddle being the um, Atlantic, sort of like that, jump from Puerto Rico, the island, to the mainland United States. Um, and this film is extremely important uh, because it's the first Puerto Rican film that examines issues of race, gender, sexuality, and homophobia in the context of the diaspora. Um, so yeah, that's the film that we all watch for today and that we're so very excited to share with all of you. Um, so, um, yeah, at uh, first I'm going to uh, ask Frances a couple of questions and sort of begin the conversation and then the Q&A will open up. Um, so Frances, <laughs> uh, again, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, so in order to provide a more context to the audience and to this conversation. Um, so the, the film is like an incredible work of, uh, an in, of archive research and editing. It's fascinating. So um, I wanted to ask you and Adrian, I wanted to ask you, how did you come about to create this film? And how is your relationship with that film today? Because currently we are in the, well, speaking about futures, we are in the future of that film. So we were wondering if you could speak more about that. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. One, there's several ways that we can narrate uh, how that film came about, depending on how we define temporality or context. Um, one way to describe it is that uh, after Aten de Barrio was released, I immediately was positioned as a spokesperson for the Puerto Rican community of Philadelphia, which is mostly working class community. And I had not been in Philadelphia that long. So it wasn't only that there were uh, differences in the majority of people that lived there and my own experience uh, coming from Puerto Rico from a middle class background. Um, but I also hadn't spent that much time in Philadelphia. And that raised questions for me. 
about, well, what was my experience? How was it different? Uh, and, and one of the conversations that was happening at the time was that there was a so-called brain drain from Puerto Rico, middle-class people coming to the United States and not returning as uh, again. Now, in, in retrospect, there are some questions about whether there's really was a brain drain at the time, uh, mm -hmm. but this was a conversation that was going on. Um, and, and when I looked around, I saw quite a number of people that I had known in Puerto Rico that were now in the United States in, in the same city that I was. So I began curious to ask, well, what was this experience? Um, how was it different from other migration experiences? And, uh, and that's where the intersectionality, I feel, of the method of the film emerges from, the type of, this type of question. I want to know, how does it look? How is this migration from the perspective of uh, a character who was not ever seen before in a Puerto Rican film, basically? Mm -hmm. um, and it took about five years to make this film. And I think what you're referring to editing is that um, at the time there was a, another conversation going on among um, diasporic filmmakers uh, in, in various places in the world. And we would get together and we would talk. And there was a lot of questions about form. There were a lot of questions about whether the types of experiences, narratives and perspectives that we wanted to articulate in film could be done with the more classic traditional or mainstream film forms. And I took that question very uh, to heart, very literally. I, I, I wanted to explore how I could tell these stories with different forms and examine the consequences and experience the consequences of that. So you will notice that the film has um, a somewhat linear uh, story, that's one layer, but it also has these constant interruptions of temporality and space. Uh, it also has references to specific genres that are important, uh, I, I would say, to, to my articulation of emotion uh, and, and place. So, for instance, the telenovela, the soap opera. Uh, so you, you'll have, you know, so on the one level, you can say this is an experimental narrative that you can uh, contextualize in any number of um, genealogies of filmmaking. Uh, but then it has these particularities of the types of materials that were threaded together in these layers. Uh, that speak to particular contexts, like Puerto Rico context, uh, Philadelphia, for instance, there are voguers there, there are uh, uh, visual, you can see visually uh, murals and other, other art forms that were coming from um, people of color in the diaspora, not in Puerto Rico. So, so all of that is, uh, you can see that very diagnostic, very multiple conversations going on at the level of form in the film. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and what you spoke about the the brain drain um, is something that is still uh, very present today, especially after Hurricane Maria. Uh, um, I remember that was a really big topic of conversation, and I think it's it's always going to be a part of the character of the Puerto Rican diaspora. Um, I do really want to talk about the come get the different layers of the film. But before that, I wanted to ask you because I found that incredibly beautiful. Um, so uh, I, come on, get, as viewer, I sort of sense that the film was divided into four chapters that were um, un, dos, tres, pescado. Mm. And uh, for, uh, English speakers, Unostra Pecao is like red light, green light game, kind of childhood game. Uh, it, the first time I saw the movie, when I saw Pescao at the end, it it, it really, it made me so happy because uh, I had never seen that uh, in a movie. Um, but yeah, it reminded me so much of this uh, childhood game um, and the part of like, Pescao is very clearly before the lesbian narrative starts playing playing in the film. Um, so I was wondering how you chose that Undo Tres Pescao as the narrative structure of the film, if that were so, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, it's part of the structure or one of the structuring mechanisms, right, of the film. Um, I, 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 if I remember, because this was a while ago, okay. <laughs> Uh, I believe that I chose one, two, three first. 
And then I said, let's make this more interesting and then put pescado. And, and the reference obviously to a, a childhood game, uh, but also that game where you advance, but then you have to freeze. I mean, so there is this tension in that game between mobility, achievement, you might be, you know, lose the game. Uh, so the, the Pescal reference just all of a sudden made one, two, three extremely complex and an entry point to think about um, all these things, right? So that, I, I, that was the, the genesis of it, but it, it didn't come at once. Uh, it came as, as often as the case when you're working on, on a film or in any creative endeavor, including scholarship. Uh, the process itself, you start connecting things and, and it leads you to uh, new possibilities. Yeah. Um, so returning to the point of the, uh, the layer of the film that I wanted that I want to ask you about. So, um, so yeah, one of what I find in also incredible about this film is that it blurs the boundary of documentary film, autobiographical narrative and fiction. And one of the points of highest tension was this scene where Claudia, the protagonist, is violently kicked out of her house by, by her father. And uh, in that scene, we can see the archetype of, of a traditional uh, Puerto Rican home where there's like the Virgin Mary and the religious figures. And I dare say it's also an archetype of uh, Latin America. It's, it's an archetype of, archetype of uh, Catholic um, values and traditions. Um, so at that scene, um, it reminded me is, is so much of the term sexile that uh, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel and Larry Lafontaine write about to describe the those people of the Puerto Rican diaspora that leave the island because of how oppressive it can be to live in Puerto Rico as an out gay person. Um, and it's also another part of it is that as viewer, I didn't live that exact scene, but I lived that tension and I lived that tension every day um, where, um, so I felt that as a queer Puerto Rican, I was pulled into that scene as, as something that I can identify within myself, within my friends, even beyond Puerto Rico. Um, and it is always in the back of my head as I think about El Retorno, um, about, I think about El Ben del Vaiven. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us about uh, now, like 27 years later, uh, what's your relationship with, um, with your sexuality in relation to Puerto Rico, in relation to El Retorno, El Ben, El Vaiven. Um, uh, yeah, the, the bridge between that scene and, and your current um, Place. Well, let me say a few things about the, the scene. Um, I, I think it's the, somebody call him, it's like the foundational scene, right? Uh, that so many people have lived through in one way or another or know someone that has. And, and one of the interesting things about it for me is that um, it is the one scene that I chose a, a very overtly a telenovela aesthetic uh, to portray it often people tell me is the scene that they felt is more realistic, which I find fascinating. <laughs> um, and I think the reason it, it, it uh, feels realistic is because the affective mode of the scene that references a, a very familiar genre uh, is part of the way we, we structure our emotions, uh, you know? Um, but in any event, um, certainly a lot of things have shifted during this 27 year period. So for instance, when I started making this film, there were uh, uh, you know, practically very few and there was no, as you mentioned uh, was, uh, earlier, no other film like it. I mean, there's still pr probably no other film like it, but there's certainly other queer films that have been made in the interim. Um, so when I brought it to Puerto Rico, the film played at a film festival here 
um, shortly after it was made and released in New York, you know, there were uh, such tension that I remember uh, the screening at the University of Puerto Rico that the organizers had um, had these students that would escort me through the campus because they thought I could be uh, attacked. Yeah. And nothing ever happened, but I had an escort, which speaks to the fear that my host had, right, about it. And then when it finally showed, there was a, 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 some tension in the room about, about it. And I recall that, uh, first of all, I was very scared. <laughs> I mean, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, and in New York, I had already had some experiences that were a little scary, like uh, people who you know, said that they wanted to slap me or, uh, you know. Uh, but when I came here, there was a tension in the room and there, it was a, first of all, it was a dead silence, like, like you could hear a pin drop. And then uh, uh, Ana Maria Garcia, who had been the person who invited me, uh, another filmmaker, uh, she said, oh, you're, you're all in shock. She made a little light of it and people relaxed a little bit. And then the conversation began. And, and one of the first questions was, had I uh, taken into account how offensive this film would be to Puerto Rican audiences? to the Puerto Rican sensibility, I think is the word that was used. Um, and then someone else immediately said, well, which one? Which Puerto Rican sensibility? And that began an interesting debate that I no longer had to directly intervene. People started talking to each other. Since then, uh, the, uh, the movement here in Puerto Rico has grown much, many more roots. It has expanded. It includes many people. Uh, during the last elections, you had the first uh, openly lesbian uh, senator elected, um, which is an indication of some shifts that have taken place. Obviously you still have uh, violence against LGBTQ people in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that's something that I, when I came out in the eighties was happening as well. So there are some continuities and there are some uh, ruptures, some, some things that have shifted. Um, I don't, I mean, Intellectually and artistically, I no longer feel when I take on these subjects or when I talk about them here in Puerto Rico that I carry the same burdens that I had that I did 27 years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, the the there is um, still a, a lot to to work on with uh, the LGBT Q and A plus rights and. Uh, in Puerto Rico, and they're always like, once a year, the Senate wants to drop all the rights, um, uh, educational and uh, uh, jobs. Yeah. Um, I mean, to use the old uh, uh, Gramsci concept that the correlation of forces, right? Um, between, let's say, those people uh, supporting um, queer rights and, and other forms of justice um, are many more now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So well, there are still groups that oppose it and, uh, and mobilize and, and, and also people suffer the consequences with their lives sometimes. Um, definitely the relationship between those that are supportive and those that are not has shifted tremendously over time. Yeah. Um... I know I watched the the film with my mother because I wanted to I gauge her reaction, um, and she she was indeed very <laughs> shocked by it. Um, but of course that's another generation. But I was also very pleased to hear that uh, she. I mean, this is personal. And she watched it. Yeah. yeah, she watched yeah. it. And she yeah. she thought it was very beautiful. Um, and she did get very sentimental about like if anything happened to me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I have to ask uh, another question that is integral part of my research. Um, so the film holds a lot of space for the racial tension between Black Puerto Ricans and African Americans uh, through captivating interviews and played out memories. Um, 
And I wanted to ask you about the role that whiteness plays in your film and why Claudia, the protagonist, speaks of mestizaje, but not directly of whiteness. You know, um, white is a category that um, I very much, dis I, I've always disidentified with. Um, so I take it, I took from, uh, at that time, I mean, the, the, the debates that have happened since are, as all, I've also brought tremendous changes, uh, in how we talk about race, but at the time, um, the, the starting point was that even white people in Puerto Rico, certainly in my own family and my own experience are not as white as they think. So, so mestizaje is a, is a reference uh, to talk about the fact that um, those discourses of whiteness are discourses of power, really not descriptive of uh, the genealogies that we make, most of us have um, of in, in, you know, interracial relations um, and, and just your own family tree, just look at your family tree, right? Um, so I think that was a, a shorthand to reference and to disrupt that other, um, other way to approach the conversation. If I was gonna do that all over again now, I would probably not use the term mestizaje uh, mm -hmm. because there has been just a lot of conversation since then uh, to the ways that discourses of mestizaje might still be supporting you know, white supremacist uh, discourses and structures. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the context where I was bringing it up, it was a way to decenter the the other discourse of, of whiteness as it relates to social political power. Mm -hmm. And another thing, it's interesting that um, the film is also not only the the first or one of the first to um, have queer protagonists. It's also one of the first films, if not the first, from Puerto Rico, a Puerto Rican filmmaker raised in Puerto Rico to include uh, Afro-Puerto Ricans in the yeah. conversation. And I feel that came about because of the experience of racialization that happens uh, to all Puerto Ricans, obviously not felt exactly in the same way. Uh, we are treated differently depending on, on how we look and our race and our accents and so forth. Uh, but certainly we all also undergo uh, a process of racialization. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking about that, uh, it immediately became evident that these other questions about um, the experience of Puerto Rican Blacks, uh, the relationship between Puerto Ricans and African Americans and other groups uh, was an important uh, set of questions to be um, included in the in this meditation in this. Um, and of course, later uh, in the last 10 years, I've been doing much more overt work by writing about Artur Alfonso Schomburg. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, discovering that for Schomburg, visuality was uh, perhaps the most important modality of representation to uh, think about the Black diaspora as central and relevant to global history. But that would be another, another topic. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that now, I mean, I was born two years before the movie was released, so I'm very young. Eh, pero para, para mí that, that point was eh, very interesting and very intriguing, of course, because I'm a white Puerto Rican, eh, and on top of that, I have eh, blue eyes and blonde hair. Um, so uh, in here in Puerto Rico, they speak to me a lot in English, and eh, in the US, if I am not uh, if I am not vocal, if I am not, if I just stay silent and walk around, I uh, walk completely as as, um, as an American, seemingly a white person. Um, and uh, yeah, so so as I enter my dissertation research, um, the interviews, uh, friendships, um, peer relationship with um, yeah, with my colleagues, like there is a, a, a lot of privilege and responsibility that I have to bring into the table. Um, and so and I use uh, white, not, not even like what white passing. So I was very intrigued that uh, 
the use of mestizaje with Claudia as she is um, washing. I think she's in the shower in that moment. Um, and another like a striking moment was when Claudia, um, I think she was in the kitchen and she was uh, mixing uh, red beans with white beans and sort of uh, leave them there to answer the door. I, Ali and I talked a lot about that scene because we wanted to know why you, what you meant uh, with that because you didn't return to the beans. So we didn't know what happened to them or was it like a metaphor? That's interesting. A, a lot of people have written about those beans. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, some people think it was a shake like I was making some uh -huh. kind of shake. Uh, so it's very um, um, ambiguous, like people read different things into it. Um, you know, that's how I make uh, uh, refried beans like in real life. <laughs> so it was just, a, a, you know, a scene of cooking and, and mixing uh, different types of uh, elements into a dish. So I guess in that sense, uh, you could read it as, um, mestizaje and also the ways that in the Caribbean people talk about uh, different beans uh, as a signifier of different Caribbean uh, experiences because we all like you know we all eat beans but we have preferences for different beans um, but I don't think I I actually had the uh, broad range of interpretations that people are brought to that moment mm -hmm. in my head when I chose to do that um, and to the question to what happened uh, that uh, I did not return, well, there was a disruption after that, right? It was a very big emotional disruption. So uh, probably nobody had dinner that night. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so before we open up, um, I have one last uh, question. Um, so, uh, returning to like the beginning of uh, the title of the film series, so we created the series thinking about temporalities and asking ourselves uh, about the queer future, not only of the country we chose to study, but also Mexico, Latin America, Puerto Rico, and the larger Caribbean. Um, and we came Okay, so Adri and I were all, all discussing the film and we noticed something very, uh, something very striking when Maritza writes to Claudia about the first uh, Puerto Rican uh, uh, pride parade, um, gay parade. Um, there is something that she says uh, in the letter is it a liberation that comes in English and then it's translated? I think it sounds something like that. I might be misquoting. Um, so then after that, as we were discussing that moment, we noticed that there are pal parallel temporalities in your film where New York or like the mainland um, is not only seen as the future, but like as the extension of the Puerto Rican archipelago. Um, and Puerto Rico is sort of seen as a, a delay, a sort of a, as a buffering, as the past, as like four seconds later. Uh, and as a Puerto Rican myself, um, uh, I can I see it in the day to day um, as like in before the boom of the internet recently. Uh, any mainstream film that was released in the US arrived in Puerto Rico two weeks later. Um, now it's much more immediate, but there is still like a week or two of delay um, of anything from the US that arrives to Puerto Rico. And, and theoretically, I could also explain like a, a psycho psychological, emotional buffering um, of the Puerto Rican people as like the, the struggle to negotiate traditional religious and cultural values instilled by the Spanish and the cultural changes that took place with the American invasion. Um, so I wanted, uh, we wanted to ask you if, if you could speak more about that um, and about uh, Puerto Rico's queer future. Okay, so the first thing I would have to say is that that, that um, 
character, Maritza is a character, um, I wanted to capture that perspective, mm -hmm. um, which was not, it's not everyone's perspective, it was not everyone's perspective then or now. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back at that text, though, I would have to say a few things. Uh, one, at the time, uh, people described Christina as uh, an American, and later, uh, we all find out. I mean, those of us that uh, didn't were not aware that uh, that she's not an American. That she also has she's also Puerto Rican. Uh, so there is that that point in that letter where it says it seems like uh, you know uh, it has to come from the U.S. and translate it. Uh, so there are errors of fact in the letter, right? Uh, if, if it was going to rewrite it now, it would have to be addressed. Um, the other thing is that some of the content of that writing, that my writing of that letter came from my own research on uh, the beginning of the contemporary queer movement in Puerto Rico. And um, so I wrote th this film pretty much uh, at, at the same time or during the same period that I was doing that research. And, uh, and it seemed like that was a sense that, um, that there was a, a migration of experiences and discourse and framings that were coming from the US to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part of how the contemporary movement begins. Um, more recently, um, I worked on uh, a series of interviews with uh, lesbian activists in Puerto Rico from the 70s. And, it, and it's become very clear that that's not entirely the case. So certainly, because of Puerto Rico's uh, colonial subjection to the US and the mass migration of Puerto Ricans to the US, there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of exchange that's happening and, and information and practices. And you also see that in the part of the film that's about ACT UP uh, Latino caucus uh, coming literally from the US to Puerto Rico, including Puerto Rican members that were from uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico to bring actions to the island. Um, but it would all, it should be said that at the time, even at, during the 70s and later, um, there's always been other points of reference that are not the US. So for instance, if you look at the archives of those early organizations, uh, particularly in the 80s, perhaps more than the 70s, um, but you could also find it in the 70s, references to Mexico and references to uh, Europe and you know, to other, other places in the world, not the US has points of references to develop theoretical frameworks and to think about um, contexts that might be more similar. Uh, let's say you're, you're, there's certain contexts that comparing to uh, Mexican experience or Colombia or Argentina uh, might be more productive for what you're trying to get um, or what you're trying to get. Uh, so in that sense, I would say that it might be one of the points in the film that I feel that I would do the most reconceptualizing because it was founded on assumptions, um, a few of which are not even, I would say, factually correct. Um, but it was certainly a perspective that was present at the time. Um, now, I, yeah, I would definitely not uh, think that um, queer Puerto Rican lives, queer movements, uh, queer aesthetics, um, that the US is the future of those. I, I think we'll be looking spatially, we'll be looking at multiple futures. You know, I, I mean, uh, spatially and, and temporally and multiple futures that are not all uh, in any one place. And that's the other thing to, to remember that at the time, New York was also very central to the queer imagination of Puerto Ricans uh, because there was a lot of Puerto Ricans there. And also because in the story of the contemporary queer movement, uh, Stonewall plays a big role. Uh, Stonewall in New York plays a big role, symbolic role, um, which is, I think, not, not that it doesn't have a role, but we know a lot more queer histories from not only, uh, you know, everywhere in the, in the U.S. and beyond. You know, we've seen uh, movies and we've seen production from, you know, everywhere in the world on these, on these questions. So, yeah, I would say that I would not... Um, assume that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. But it, there is still that perspective lingering, um, yes. especially with within older generations. Um, I mean, if you think about the, the Ricky Renuncia um, mobilizations and the role of queer organizers there and queer aesthetics and queer practices, um, you can, you, you, I don't think you can narrate that as a, 
as something emanating from the U.S. in that other in that way that it was suggested earlier in the in the film in that moment in that letter. Um, I think we're talking about a much more dense uh, mm -hmm. uh, web of interconnections uh, that definitely have more much of a rhizomatic structure than just uh, linear or you know one way or even two ways. I mean. We're, you know, the Puerto Rican diaspora is not only much bigger than ever, but it's also settled in many more places. Um, so, so now it's, it's uh, those kinds of visualizations of, of the relationship between Puerto Ricans in the archipelago, uh, in the Caribbean archipelago and the rest of the archipelago, wherever they, they are, uh, it's, it's not sustainable at this point, you know, it's much more yeah. complex. Yeah. I agree. Um, thank you so much, Francis. Uh, so now um, we're going to open up to the audience. I think there are a few questions. And please write your question in the Q&A. Um, we'd love to discuss. Um, OK, so I think there's a question. Um, so. Can you tell us more about the archival work done for this film and how do you relate the work of uh, your work to the archives and the fact uh, of creating queer histories, queer archives, et cetera? So many layers to that. Um, okay, so as far as the film is concerned, I, I created, I had to build certain archives and I was also producing archives at the same time, right? Because some of the materials I shot, I shot them and, and now they're archival materials. And then some of the um, material I acquired it from other people and, and built a particular archive that gave form to the film. And those archives included um, films um, and photographs of the Puerto Rican diaspora as it settled in the US from the 40s onward, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, it included, uh, and that was mostly that black and white film material that you see in the film. And, and a lot of that material came from the Center for Puerto Rican Studies archive and the Schomburg Center. Um, and then you have video material and, and, and video uh, as a mode of, of a technology of production uh, becomes more and more uh, accessible and, and ubiquitous obiqu during this time, right? I was shooting in 60 millimeter. Um, so in fact, that whole question of should I incorporate video? How would I do that? It's so expensive to transfer to film. And we ended up doing a very um, casero approach to it, like projecting it uh, into the wall and shooting it on 60 millimeter, right? Uh, which was not necessarily the most crisp way uh, uh, to get an image, but it was the affordable way that we had. Um, so yeah, I mean, the film, because in so many moments, the film had these disruptions that engage with memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that memory uh, includes experiences that the character had herself, let's say, uh, but also includes exper experiences that other people relate to her. Uh, for instance, that uh, footage of the first uh, Puerto Rican Pride Parade in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and also you have material that, um, you know, references time periods that the character never experienced or places that the character has never been. Um, so in that sense, I would say that the archival material served this um, as a site of engaging with memory or visualizing memory, visualizing what you imagine. Uh, and, and in the editing process, I mean, you mentioned the word editing at the beginning, uh, the film itself then weaves a, a, a visual landscape that's particular to the film to, to share, uh, you know, how is this character piecing history together and in that process making her own subjectivity or, or founding her own subjectivity uh, through that very practice. Um, since then, um, I be, I become a curator of an archive. Um, I uh, call the uh, Latino Arts and Activism Archive at Columbia University. I started mostly um, interested in, in Latino materials from the, the city of New York. But as the project became more known, uh, people started to approach me that uh, had been in the larger uh, Northeast or even from Puerto Rico. We have a few collections that got there at the initiative of the estates uh, of, of those um, writers and artists. 
Uh, and in practicing that type of work, like for instance, one of the most consulted archives in that collection is Manuel Ramos Oteros' work. Um, I, have, I have seen that there's a lot of scholarship about archives uh, that are really talking about the official archives, uh, you know, and, and all archives obviously have limitations of what uh, they lend themselves to and blind spots and so forth. But as I, I began to bring those materials to Colombia at the time that I started the project, Colombia only had one collection of, of a Latino writer or, or, or in rare book and manuscript. Uh, being in the city of New York, that's not a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in the process really began, began to develop this idea of archives of possibility, uh, which is the engagement of, with materials that in some ways they were never meant to, to make it into the archive. Um, I mean, to paraphrase Audrey Lorde, uh, you know, was never meant to be, yet uh, through the care of multiple people, sometimes over decades, you know, making sure that that they're safe and in, in, uh, uh, that they will be able to be deposited somewhere in a the future, uh, they are now in a, in a space that can be consulted and accessed. Um, which obviously doesn't mean that archives are the only way to memorialize. You know, uh, there's many things that are not, uh, uh, and many experiences, many perspectives that are not in the archive for which people engage in other practices like uh, oral history and the um, and in body practices of art and like Ana Mendieta, let's say. I mean, so that's not the paper and archives in a library are not the only ways, the only ways to memorialize, but I find it in my own practice that are, they are important to have. And of course, when I got deeper and deeper into the work about Arthur Schomburg and saw how he conceptualized the role of archives in telling the story uh, of the black diaspora and including Afro-Latinos, and, and, and Blacks from the Caribbean very centrally in the story through archives. Um, you know, I, I became even more interested in um, the curatorial role. And at, and at this point, when we are in, a, in an environment where everybody's really curating archives every day, yeah. uh, raises a whole, a whole number of other questions, like what, what's gonna be the future of those archives? Uh, how are they accessible? What do we make of them? And so forth. Um, we have another question that I'm really excited about. Um, so uh, this viewer asks, says, and then asks, um, I was intrigued by how lesbian invisibility was defined in the film in relation to the patriarchal society's inability to imagine or allow women's access to erotic pleasure. I wanted to, I wanted to know how you approach lesbianism, lesbian visibility, and if it has changed since the film? Another interesting question. So I, I had finished pretty much the cut. I had a full cut. And, and then this question of that the film doesn't have any visualization of sexuality started to haunt me a little bit. Uh, and I can start consulting because I was I had some questions or concerns about it, um, objectifi objectification, uh, was one of them, um, and, uh, and and then I realized there was actually no scene, no scene between lesbians in a Puerto Rican movie that I knew of. <laughs> uh, so that kind of uh, led me to feel that even if I get it wrong, <laughs> uh, it at least opens up a possibility, so I am going to do it. Uh, and then I was like, how to do it? So if you notice, um, that sequence is in black and white, uh, which is a kind of distancing a bit uh, mechanism um, within a film that's otherwise mostly in color. Uh, it also has these interruptions that call attention to the uh, a voyeuristic uh, uh, subject, like don't look, what are you doing, you know, this kind of thing, um, which is another distancing strategy for the sequence. Um, and um, you know, and that's how I solved that or, or solved those uh, questions that I had at the time, or at least settled them for the purpose of the film, which is to create a space for uh, lesbian uh, sexuality, uh, but at the same time, create a certain type of frame in and disruptions within so it couldn't be easily uh, appropriated um, and demeaned in, you know, um, how do I think about that now? Um, I would shoot it very differently now. 
because I think the I I shot it in a in a very um, pretty way, also, <laughs> um, which I think was a, a, well. The film in general has that desire to be beautiful in some way, uh, but this aesthetic of this particular sequence is trying to make it uh, even more beautiful. Uh, and I, I don't think that would be a goal necessarily if I was doing it uh, now. And 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 I'm working on a project. Uh, actually more than one project, but I'm thinking of one in particular where sexuality is gonna play a, a very central role in the narrative. And, and I will be approaching it quite different. In fact, one of the critiques that I got to that scene or sequence was that it looked like a commercial, <laughs> you know? So it was like too, too beautiful in a way, uh, too manicured, uh, too, you know, not raw enough or not uh, visceral enough. Um, so anyway, so that, that's, uh, definitely I would be, th I think thinking about it differently. And I, and I also feel that I would be testing other forms or visual vocabulary to, um, represent that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I didn't receive it as commercial at all. I thought that it was beautiful. Yes, but not commercial, but I also, uh, throughout the film and even in this part, I love the uh, text interventions that sort of como que pull in the audience more into the film, but especially in that part was like, what are you looking at? And it's sort of como que that uh, it contests the patriarchal gaze that also is como uh, yeah, como que queerness as a side of contestation to the patriarchal, to the man is also como que an underline of the film. And you, you see that with the reference, the, the weight that the father uh, has in the film um, and how his death sort of um, incites Claudia's reflection, uh, self-reflection and reflection on the return, reflection of queerness in Puerto Rico, um, memories, etc. Um, it, so a final question uh, is, what is your relationship between writing and film and how's that relationship changed over time? Well, I think I, um, I always have written, I mean, since I'm a teenager, uh, but I've also have made films since I'm even younger than that. So in fact, I'm working on a film right now that is based on my home movies and uh, recordings that I started uh, gathering and producing, producing um, when I was four. Um, so, uh, and it's given me a lot of, of, of space to think about the relationship between writing and film. And, and in this particular film, um, one of the things that I, that will be a part of that reflection is how I associate and have associated uh, for most of my career film with community. And uh, because for instance, I think about the first, the motivation to make Ace in the Barrio or to make Brincando Charco was, was also community building. In the first case, community building to protect people's health. Uh, and in the second uh, the film, community building to strengthen our, our ties uh, intersectionally and to strengthen movements. And so it's been a collective Whereas uh, when I look at when I started writing and what did I write, uh, I was mostly writing poetry and, in a, in a, and I wrote it when filmmaking seemed no longer viable because of changes in my environment. Um, and then I come back to film after mostly writing for a while, for about a decade. And then I come back to film as, a, as an adult. Um, and the relationship continues to shift when I came into academia, for instance, uh, I was mostly writing and not only writing um, essays, which I think is, is my main genre, uh, has been my main genre, but also writing more academic prose and, uh, and so forth. And then my, my filmmaking, um, you know, I started experimenting with different formats and different technologies. And there was like a period where I had to recalibrate my relationship to film because I was writing a lot uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it, these are very intense endeavors, you know, it's hard to keep a, a certain level of, of clarity and, um, 
and, and, and doing work that you feel is good at the same time. Uh, and now I would say that uh, the, um, the solution that I'm experimenting with, particularly with that one film that uh, where this relationship between film and, and, and the word is actually part of the reflection of it, uh, that I'm going to experiment with uh, kind of converting or, or like doing some of the work in print and some of the work in film, but the two uh, outcomes still uh, dialogue with each other. So instead of doing it serially, which uh, or in in the mean in meantime, you know, try to integrate the two more uh, close closely. Okay. Yeah, and this question also resonates uh, with with um, a, not to speak for Adri, um, he's here, but it resonates a lot with um, us. Uh, attempting to write our dissertation chapters um, and how, uh, yeah, most of, of uh, our research map is based on films and analyzing films and uh, writing as uh, photography is also like a very central theme of our brainstorming. Um, uh, I mean, one of the ways that I, that got me thinking in a different uh, direction was my work on Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, a lot of people would describe me as a painter or as a visual artist, um, but I also think he's a writer. I mean, so mm -hmm. much of his work has writing in it. Uh, and, and it's not just writing as a, a visual element as in some other people's work. He is doing, in my opinion, uh, heavy lifting by linking using various types of science, uh, language and, and visual science, linking the two in order to work through certain questions. Um, and, 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 and that practice, uh, when I kind of saw it in that, in that way, in those terms, uh, I became inspired to start um, working more in that direction. Like how can we use a variety of science and, and relay? Because I think the method that he really develops is relate how can how does these element uh, these signs can help us understand something by the way that we provide possible relations between them and not only one relation because you look at a, at a piece and you it's not like he's going to give you an explanation he's going to tell you the web of relationships mm -hmm. between elements uh, that have this myriad of effects some of which we might be aware and some of which might be visible and some of which we still not clear about and need to dig deeper, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's methodologically speaking, that's another way of approaching uh, this question is that I think um, my politics are probably haven't changed that much, uh, what I think is important and, and so forth, but uh, my methods uh, have shifted some. Okay. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, we're at time, but uh, thank you so much, Frances, for that reflection. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, we always have to be open to our methods changing. If not, where's the space of, of growth um, as scholars uh, and as people? Um, anyways. Um, I want to again thank uh, Marcela and Dr. Klaas um, and everyone who came to see the Q&A. It really meant so much. Uh, my friends at Puerto Rico are also here and I'm really happy. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you, Frances. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, it's, it was a pleasure. Thank you all and congratulations, Laura. And uh, it's... Laura, perdón, en esta iniciación de the, the series. It was a great event and thank you, Francis, for being here. Of course, thank you. See you on December 1st for the second one. Yes. Ciao. Thank, thank you. you.